Um, obviously, you've, I'm just looking in track one. Obviously, the people before me did an awesome job. Lots of great feedback. Well done. I know that AAC in the Cloud always produces such great topics for all of us to talk about. So I'm going to share my screen now and um, open up my slides and we're going to make a start. So let's share and I'll pull up my slides. Okay, so today, yes, my topic is more than the device. And I guess it's just really looking at all those different ways that we communicate and not just, you know, that's us as well as any of the AAC users that we support. So welcome to you all. Send me a message. Let me know who's there. Um, I have my colleague, Villa Mine. She stayed up late. <laughs> um, I obviously work for the company Assist of Wear um, today. I, I'm presenting on behalf of them and my colleague, Villa, Villa Mine, is is out there and she might answer any questions. She also is a good friend and always big fan. She's always my fan coming along to watch me speak. So as I said, I'm Amanda. Um, and I guess as a speech pathologist, um, I work for assistive wear. I do a few other bits and pieces. I consult in schools around AAC. But probably the thing that's the most important to me is the people that we work, um, the families that I support. And, and you know that you've been doing it a long time when you're starting to see the clients or who now I would say my friends, uh, friends graduating from school and turning into adults. So, hey, hello, Marlene. Hello, Shana, Caitlin, Julie. There's a few of you joining. Good morning to you all. Thanks so much. Yeah, so you know you've been around a while, over 20 years when you start seeing your, your very good friends um, starting to turn into adults and it changes the journey of how you support them with the AAC as well. Okay, so let's get on to it. I've got a question for you guys out there if you're playing along in the Slack channel. So what are some of the ways you communicate? Yell them out at me. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Some of you have commented you've been watching some of our videos on the assistive web page. So thanks. <laughs> thanks. So tell me, what are some of the ways you guys communicate? I'm, I can see you're all typing madly your answers. <gasps> Maybe typing is one of the ways you communicate, right? Facial expressions. <laughs> My kids are experts at that. Well said, Melissa. Facial expressions, so nonverbal, all of that nonverbal behavior stuff. Emojis, one of my favorite ways to communicate. Pointing, smiling, texting. Wow. Email, gestures. You guys like just ping, 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 ping. Body language, you're right about that. Sounds, vocalizations, texting, pecs. Yes, pic, picture exchange communication. So Zoom, Zoom is all new. We are all using Zoom. Sighing, <sighs> yes, lots of different ways that you and I, that we all communicate. Video chat, so many ways to communicate. What about, is it different if we start looking at our AAC users? Do they have different ways again that they communicate? Marco Polo, <laughs> Marco Polo, nice Caitlin. Um, anybody watching this video back later, it might seem strange, I'm talking in random, but I actually have a, an online live group of people responding to my questions over here on Slack. So don't worry about that, Marco Polo. So yeah, is it different? Is communication, do, do also your AAC users communicate in lots of different ways? Oh, Marco Polo is a video chat app. I thought you were talking about the game, Marco Polo. That's embarrassing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's the same. Yeah. So just like we communicate in lots of different ways, um, actually our AAC users might communicate in lots of different ways as well. <clears throat> yep. So they might use gestures. They, they might also have a voice app device. I don't know, not many of us speaking folk have our own voice output device. An AAC user might uh, communicate with their feet and walk away. Yeah, that's true too. So there are differences, but I, I guess I was just trying to point out that we all have different ways that we communicate. So let's have a look at that because there's a big challenge to this because people that can't speak, uh, AAC users, are at a disadvantage in a speaking world. And they seem to always get that constant message that verbal communication is that thing that's preferred. Um, verbal communication is expected, it's prioritised, it's demanded. How many times have you, I've stood in the back of a classroom and I've seen an educator saying, use your words, demanding that speech. Um, it even seems as if some Sometimes speaking is more valued and more respected. And I think that there is a real danger in these messages 
that verbal communication comes across this way because every day our AAC users, people that have communication difficulties that cannot always speak reliably, they get that message from the speaking world that if you speak, then we listen. And I think that's quite a, da a dangerous assumption. I think that's a dangerous message that that family, um, that AAC users constantly hear because basically we, we are saying that one way to communicate is better than another and that people will only listen to the spoken word and that further to that if you can't speak how you're, you're judged and, and the perception of your skills um, but based on the fact that you you can't speak or you can't always reliably speak so this is kind of part of what for me what I want us to be about of a bit of a change in the AAC community and I know that um, definitely the the folks that come along to AAC in the cloud are part of that change and start part of driving that change of how how we can change our mindsets about about things so and I I could I could have said it in lots of different ways, um, but I may, you know, I think Alyssa Hillary said it best when they said the goal should not be verbal speech, but good communication. And to me, that pretty much summarises what our goal should be, good communication. And it's not it, it really, for me, it's about communication and not just communication, but connection. Um, the method of how that happens is really secondary. And this requires a mindset change. Like for me, I'm a speech pathologist. Did you hear that? Speech. So I'm like all about giving speech or teaching speech and talking. Is that, am I giving up if I'm not expecting speech? But of course I'm not. But really I should be a communication. It should be about communication. But I don't think that doesn't work but as to change my title but anyways you know what I mean it's about a mindset change for all of us what's important it's about the communication and the connection okay so um yes well mindset my 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 very good friend and colleague Marlene said the idea of mindset change and obviously um, Marlene and Rachel Langley presented they've got a awesome pre-conference one you should watch that talks all about how we can get that mindset change happening as well Okay, so, and it starts like this. How do we get that mindset change? The first thing is, is that we, we re remember that it's up to the AAC user at all times, no matter how old they are, and um, we always respect the AAC user. It's their choice. They are the ones who decide when they communicate, how they communicate, like so what method of communication and to whom they wish to communicate. Um, I uh, was working with a young man yesterday. Now he he has some verbal communication and he uses Proloquo to go. And um, thanks to some wonderful AAC users, um, I've been starting to talk to him about the concept of mouth words versus when he wants to use his proloquo to go. And I've started saying to him, well, it's your choice. When we do this activity, are you going to use your mouth words and, and then use your proloquo to go when you need it, when I don't understand you or, or not? And even um, yesterday, he didn't want to do anything. And I said to him, oh, I can see you've got your head down. You don't want to use any of your, you don't want to communicate today. Okay, let me, don't worry, no pressure. I'll, I'll take a turn and let me, let me have a go. And just by taking the pressure off, showing that I respected that it was his choice when he spoke or when he didn't speak, of course, he naturally, I told a joke and then he was in and we were laughing. Um, somebody has commented in the Slack channel that you call yourselves communication therapists. I really, really like that. <laughs> um, the other really important part of this mindset change and accepting that, um, you know, not one, it's about all about communication is that we have to respect the time of that because most alternatives, all alternatives to speech are slower to produce. So we have to like make sure that 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 um, that we're aware of that and that we allow time, we respect the time that it takes and that we um, are making that time for it. That's pretty important too, okay? And then, then ultimately all of this comes down to us and what we can do. It's about um, what we do as communication partners, as speaking people, it's, the, it's our work, it's up to us. We've got to look at what the barriers are and look at ways that we can problem solve to support that good communication. Um, and for me, that's kind of the, the, the key message of, of all of this. So let's now start talking about all the ways that we communicate. Um, thank you. Deanna said, yes, all of this message does go well with that 
diversity, inclusive, inclusive message that we, we are getting out there at the moment. So thank you. Um, so yes, if you've got any questions, of course, you can always put them onto the Slack channel and I'll try and answer them as we go. And I will allow some time at the end for any specific questions. So let's talk about all the ways that we communicate, which are many and varied. Um, and I guess if you've been around in the AAC world uh, for a while, you might have heard the term multimodal communication, that we use different modes of communication. Um, so that, that's all I'm, I'm going to be talking about today. And probably the thing that I want to make clear is that accepting and talking about all these different ways to communicate happens across the lifespan. Like we should be, we should be talking about this for our youngest, most emergent communicators as for everybody, um, that all regard all yes users, regardless of age, are going to be communicating in different ways. And our job, in my opinion, is about encouraging all those different ways, not putting value that one way is better than any another, and that we respect that it's their choice to use the one that they want, and even thinking about ways that we can build in because sometimes different ways of communication are actually far more engaging and real than um, perhaps traditional AAC. Okay, um, so throughout the next little bit, I'm going to be talking about some of the benefits, the limits, because I mean, for each of these things, there might be benefits or limitations, and um, there could be barriers to certain things. And of course, I, that's me, I always want to talk about some practical things that maybe we can do. Okay, so let's start with speaking. Um, so speaking obviously is one way that we communicate. And if you cannot rely on your speech um, or you are unable to speak or can speak a little bit, um, whatever it looks for the AAC user, um, then quite often we've focused on supporting how they in engage in face-to-face -face conversations. So face-to-face -face conversations. Of course, this has all changed now that we're all online so much more. So um, we've had to think about considering how we provide support to people over, over time and space as well. But, but typically we've always talked about face-to-face -face conversations and how that looks. And there's a lot of challenges to actually to face-to-face -face conversations um, and the speaking in those. Obviously, they're usually very fast-paced. Um, they can often be very unpredictable in terms of what could be discussed. You could end up going anywhere. Um, spend half an hour with me. I guarantee you won't predict anything that we'll end up talking about. So, you know, like it's it, that and that's the nature of conversations and how they flow. The good bit about conversations, of course, is the vibe and the feel. When you're in in the same space as somebody, you get a feel for their vibe. You get a feel for their demeanor. Um, you can kind of get a sense of, of how they're, um, you know, listening and, and appreciating what you're saying. Um, number one, the thing that continues to present itself as the biggest barrier for someone who uses AAC is the timing of things, like how fast it is and how um, by the time you have listened to the conversation, processed what you wanted to say, thought of what you wanted to say, found it on your AAC, typed it, typed it all out, the conversation already moved on five minutes ago. So that timing factor is really, really important. Um, and that leads into that, that other barrier is that actually the behavior of us as the speaking people that has the biggest impact in conversations. Um, so let's talk about how we can change that. So some there's a couple of things that, that I often talk about in this space about how an AAC user can take up a more valued role in a conversation. Um, some of it comes to do with physical space. Like, you know, if you are in the same space together, um, can it be... Um, are you affected by background noise or they're sitting and you're standing over top of them? So do you need to organise so that you can be in a quieter place where you're seated together? So changing that physical space can often, sometimes change the impact of, of how the conversation looks. And also to this, it's always for me about conversations about planning ahead. So if um, the AAC user really benefits from, you know, it's too noisy, I need a quieter place to communicate, then maybe they need something programmed on the AAC that says, it's too noisy here, can we find a quieter place to talk? So it's about thinking about these things in advance and having strategies in place and teaching those from a very 
from from the get go, like that we don't assume that a, a kid has to be at a certain age or competence level before we start introducing these principles of being able to advocate for themselves in speaking situations. Um, so planning ahead. Um, I also like the idea of you know, working on conversation starters and continuers and having some of that stuff pre-thought out. I mean, you cannot predict every single thing that could come up in a conversation, but you can have some really good things, things that you want to talk about um, or things that you know you're going to go bowling so you can plan ahead and that can reduce that time um, that time to plan, write something called compose a message on the spot. The other really, really important strategy now, and I think now more than ever is a great thing, is thinking about what conversations can be moved to asynchronous forms of communication. So asynchronous means that they're in a different time and space. Um, and I just think that now more than ever, what conversations that we might have said, I had to have it face to face to you, what can be moved to being communicated in a different way, like send you a text message, take a photo of something can send it as a message rather than having to talk to you about it face to face. So I think it's just about looking at and if we if we have this repertoire of all these different ways that we communicate, then we can definitely move into that space. Okay, I also, while we're talking about speaking, I really wanted to talk about that whole idea about part-time AAC and um, those uh, people that have intermittent speech. So they might say that their speech is unreliable, um, that speech is effortful. Um, I've heard people say that their speech capacity does not match their thoughts, as in they, they cannot say as much as what they're thinking. And um, when they learnt to, to, to type their thoughts, there was so much more that they could say than their mouth ever could. Um, I guess the reason that I, I, again, I always like to talk about this is because um, there's quite a lot of part-time AAC users that actually found AAC as adults. And I think that that's part of um, our challenge as a, as a community to say, well, from any age, AAC should be presented um, not as an alternative, but as a support tool. Um, it's not it's not harmful to have AAC as a backup for when your speech doesn't work. Have you? I mean, how many of you have seen a young person that you can just tell is so struggling to get the words out? You've observed them having a meltdown and they just can't find the words. You can't. Um, you know, you just, you, you know, as I said, that mindset change that you, you, somebody thinks they can speak, so they should just always and only use speech, but they need a backup for those times when they have more to say and they can't coordinate their, their mouth because it's so effortful or whatever. I mean, I, I just think for, for us, for us that can speak, we just take it for granted how bloody easy it is, right? And I think that if as a community, we think, from an earlier age, there's no harm in having AAC as a backup tool for speech that's not reliable or speech that's really effortful. There's no, so I'd just like for us to be able to consider that at a much younger age. The last part of speaking is that we need to consistently teach our AAC users um, give them the power. I mean, basically challenging the behavior of this, the, of the speaking communication partners. Um, basically that, that requires um, basically if they have a good communication partner that can advocate for them, but that's not always the case. And so I think that we should definitely be looking at how we can challenge their behaviour and teaching AAC users really early things like give me more time, um, please be patient while I write my reply. I use my iPad when my speech doesn't work. Have pre-programmed phrases that, that can just be splurted out. Um, the proliquo to go buttons that you see on the, the right side there, um, this was a, a young man and literally he said to me once, people talk about me like I'm not even there. And so we put this button of, I can understand everything you say, ask me the questions and talk to me rather than about me. And this, just by him having those buttons, being able to advocate for himself in situations where the conversation was going around him about him, he could advocate for himself, um, which has been really powerful because then, of course, that changes people's perception and interaction of him when he can start advocating for himself. 
Um, while we're speaking about speaking, we should also talk about how that looks for video or uh, phone and video calls as well, which we've all done a heck of a lot more of. Does the tech work? Does our AAC work with um, when you're Zooming, can your AAC be heard loud enough? If you've got a, um, one of my friends uses a Bluetooth speaker, so we can hear her quite well when we're Zooming together. Um, but of course, most phone calls and video calls, they might be short and fast, particularly a phone call. Um, and often you, when you can't see a person, it changes the interaction quite often. And actually, a lot of AAC users told us that um, that when they tried to make a phone call, um, that people thought... Um, that people thought that they were being pranked and they would get hung up on all the time. Um, and so in this case, again, that comes back to that planning ahead, you know, being able to email ahead to say, I need to call someone to talk about it. I use, I'm going to use my AAC, my communication device to talk to you. So um, getting past uh, through some of those barriers. Um, some of the newer updates with the iOS on iPads, you know, now you can actually make a phone call and FaceTime at the same time as using your Proloquo for text or Proloquo to go, which is pretty cool as well. So, yes, I like Julie's backing me up. Self-advocacy, single hit buttons. Yes, very important things. And um, people were agreeing about the, um, yeah, yeah, that get part-time AAC users considering it sooner. But there are barriers, yes, but people's mindsets and attitude changes about AAC being for everyone. It is sad but true. Um, yeah. And the, the um, yeah, the Communication Bill of Rights. Thank you, Marlene. That's really, that's really uh, good to consider as well. Um, okay, so let's keep moving on. Thank you for your comments on all of this as well. Um, I, I think that the part-time AAC, if I can just share one story, um, I have quite a lot of um, schools that I work in and schools that are taking like a whole school approach to AAC. So like literally um, the teachers are having AAC in their classroom for their classroom instruction. And what has been good about that is that the teachers have seen that those kids that really need the AAC because they have very limited verbal skills or whatever are making progress. But those kids that traditionally wouldn't have been considered for AAC because it was, you know, in the environment everywhere, they were picking up and using it and showing how it could help them when their speech wouldn't work. That's been actually, if we're talking about this part-time intermittent speech, that's been something that's been really good about changing mindsets because the teachers using AAC as part of their whole class instruction and all of the students are getting benefit to it, that we are actually seeing that people that traditionally wouldn't have been considered for AAC are being thought of as of it as being a tool that really supports their spoken communication. And uh, I'm just, I'm just going to go back down. So, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit like a, oh, squirrel, because look, some of my favorite people are over here sending, um, commenting. That means that they're out there watching. Hello, Miss Kelly, one of my favorite people and Marlene. I mean, there's lots, sorry, not to pay, play favorites on anything, but anyway, it's nice to have you all out there in the audience and commenting. Um, Kelly commented that she used the telephone relay service um, for that reason. So that's another way with the prank calls, if you use the telephone, telephone speech relay service, that does overcome that barrier so that and then they could introduce her and then explain how she's going to communicate. So um, thank you very much. That's a very good point. So <laughs> Kelly wants to know where my puppets are. I didn't bring one today. I'm so, that's terrible. I always have a puppet. That's how Kelly and I first met, puppets. Anyways, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the things for communication devices. So obviously, um, when we start talking about someone who they, they have their own communication device, a communication device makes it possible for someone to speak during those conversations. And some of our challenges is making sure that we have um, having the, the devices available, um, are the communication devices accessible across different environments? And of course, just like any technology, we do have fails related to our communication device. Um, uh, you know, just even, you know, it's not charged, it's not turned on, all of those sorts of things. And people miss my kangaroo puppet. 
sorry, I'll have to, um, I don't know, it's in here somewhere, but it's in that mess over there. Um, so some of the strategies you can see in this photo here, this is me wearing my words. I've got all my harnesses and straps and got my AAC strapped on, my pod book strapped on. Um, so just, you know, making sure that you are you can carry your AAC really makes a difference for, for the use of the device. Some of these things we know about. Um, sound levels, do you, can you hear the communication device? Do you need a Bluetooth speaker? Um, some of the newer iPads and other devices have quite good volume now but you might need that. Um, we know that there's a whole lot of strategies that relate to our AAC learners. I'm not going to talk about all of that today. Um, but really, probably the main strategy with your communication devices is just thinking about uh, what's an alternative? Like what can you use if your communication device isn't available or isn't accessible or is taken away? Always having that backup uh, way is pretty important. And so one of those things is, of course, our communication boards and books that we have and um, making sure, I mean, these communication boards and books are really useful because um, they can be visible and accessible in all different conditions. And... Oh, yes, look, Villamine shared the, the, that little poster that you see on my screen there. That is, um, that is the, the printout made in a poster on the wall. So having these are the new quick communication boards that assist aware that we brought out last month. Um, communication boards are really fantastic because of that being able to be visible and accessible across different conditions. Um, now, I just see a comment here. Um, I'm going to respond to the Wisconsin Man 13 comment in just a minute. I'll just finish here and I'll go back to it because I, I think it is important as well. The thing, the problem, I mean, it's a good and a, neg a positive and a negative about communication boards is that to use a good a communication board or a book well, it requires close attention from a communication partner. So in terms of you have to be looking at what the person's pointing to because they could be pointing to something, but if you don't see it without voice output, you, you might not see them point to something. But this is a good thing because it makes the communication partner more responsive and more alert as well. So the, the, you know there's goods and bads about the communication board. Um, so the strategies for this is just making sure you make backup copies and have them, I kind of have them around everywhere, um, hang them up, different forms. It could be an alphabet board if you can, um, you know, point to letters to communicate. And that actually it's not just about making them and printing them and hanging them up everywhere. Um, oh, yes. And David did talk about this today. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing that link. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, and the communication boards are good for summer school, um, you know, for the for other staff, people that want to use them but don't have full access to AAC. There's so many good reasons why we would use these communication boards. You guys are all over it. And I, I guess the, the main thing that I would say, it's all well and good to print them out and hang them everywhere, but really you have to have the practice using them um, in the event that that communication is not available. So it's really important that make sure that we, we have them around, uh, but we also show how they're used as well. Okay. Um, so before I move on, let me just, just check where I'm up to. Um, before I move on to the next section, I just I just really wanted to reiterate. I know we, we're going backwards and forwards. So that's me like a whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, but that that part-time AAC that we were talking about just a, a little bit now um, before, where were we talking about it? Back here. Uh, that that is challenging because a lot of parents and, and even the teachers that support them, um, they still, you know, they still think that they, they're hoping that their child will talk. And that's a natural, I mean, that's not an, un, that's a natural thing. Um, yeah, that, but, but as, oh, thank you, Elisa, uh, uh, Elisa, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. I think that's why it's more important that the voices of our current part-time AAC users are elevated. Yeah, that re, I agree with you. When we hear from those that use AAC part-time that to help parents understand that it's not one or the other, but it's both, as you say. Thank you very much for that contribution to the conversation. Everybody, way to go. Okay, so 
we were talking here about communication devices and then we finished by talking about all those wonderful communication boards loads of variations of them all around um so let's let's look at what's next i also wanted to talk quickly about like even the power of facial expression and body language these are again really important um ways to communicate things that actually we do all of the time the challenge i guess uh, well there's there's a a few things but first of all we know that by adding facial expression and body language actually adds a lot of meaning and engagement to thing for someone who uses AAC I think the timing can be quite difficult because you're you having to time your facial expression with the delivery of a message that you thought of before so it's kind of must be very awkward for them I can only just imagine how they get the timing of facial expression um, right um, and the only other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, we should consider facial expression and body language as forms of communication, like respond to it as if the message, oh, yeah, I get it, that you're laughing, that was really funny, I think it's funny too, you know, like just accepting those forms of communication without making them say it in another way. Um, the, uh, yeah, and also the involuntary movements is another dot point there, just to say some even though facial expression and body language is useful for some people to add meaning, there's also others that experience difficulty controlling um, and may have involuntary movements that makes it tricky as well. Um, from a perspective of using facial expression and body language as ways to communicate for our AAC learners, we would accept that they are telling us something by using their face or their, their body language. Um, so I, I just I just have to share, this is a very good example of accepting a facial expression. Um, Sarah in the Slack channel has said, a client of mine tends to stick her lower lip out to protest and complain. And we've been accepting it and really encouraging it um, and modeling the core, core vocab to express the same message since most people understand that expression and she's, they're doing it more deliberately. This is exactly perfect example. When we attribute meaning to it, we respond to it consistently. We respect it. The, um, you know, the only thing is, is if, if you're the only one that understands it, then you really want to try and link it to how they can say it with AAC. So a young friend of mine, Jack, he had um, quite a, a number of different facial expressions, gestures, body languages, that behaviors even that he did. And not everyone, always understood um, you know all the different ways that he communicated and so we started uh, every time every time he would tap you on your arm away like this we'd go oh you're telling us to wait and we'd point to wait on his uh, communication board so we started linking it so that he could over time we would still accept that he was telling us to wait but we would start trying to obviously link it to a, a way that anybody could understand um, so that's important too. All right. So what pointing and looking, oh, well, that's, there's nothing more easily understood pointing gestures. Um, if you've got someone who looks at things, you just have to be super observant and be respectful that if they're looking at something, they may look, have you seen kids that drive holes in things and you know exactly what they're trying to talk about and, and request it's really, really, um, yeah. Um, Deanna has a friend who pokes her tongue out, yes, um, you know, so that that's just her way. I, I guess as long as people can know and understand that that's her personal way of communicating, that I think that's important as well. So it's really important that we're observant, we watch for people, um, and we accept and respond to all these different ways of communicating. And same, even moving forward, sign language and gesture. These are all different ways that we communicate. Often natural gesture in context is fast and is really easy to be understood. Like, see you later, go away, all those sorts of gestures. Anybody can understand those. Sign language can be a little bit more tricky. Um, uh, you know, like if the communication partner doesn't know signing, the person they're trying to talk to, and motor difficulties can affect, obviously, sign language and gesture. But the bigger picture about all these things, so the, the last kind of things I talked about, the pointing and looking, the facial expression, the body language, gestures, sign language, is that one of the big challenges that I see is that people with communication impairments are often made repeat themselves 
And, and I always see like, it's almost like you can, do I have to repeat myself? If, if somebody has communicated to you in a way that you understood, they were pointing at something, they were very clear, you all understood it in the context, it made sense. And then somebody pushes their AAC towards them and says, now tell me with this, you know, um, and you like, I, I, I'm sure that I've literally seen kids roll their eyes at people like, why do I have to repeat myself? You understood what I said. Um, and yes, as Caitlin said, this often leads to behaviors, not only behaviors, it can actually lead to them hating AAC because you only made me do it when you already understood what I said. This thing's really weird. It doesn't make sense to me. Why are you making me do it when you already know what I say? So I think it's really important in this whole idea about how we're, we're, we're building and showing accepting and respecting that they use it. Um, Maybe the better clue, cue could be, tell me more. Oh, do you have more to tell me about that? Oh, I can see you're looking at that book on the shelf. You really want me to read the book. Can you tell me any more about that? I'm going to go get the book. You think if you want to tell me any more. So I think that's really important that we don't make people repeat themselves. I don't like repeating myself. Um, I will if I feel like I haven't been listened to. But, you know, I, I don't like that as well. So no, none of us like that feeling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for all your wonderful comments in the Slack channel. You're all very chatty. Very good. Okay, now where's what button am I going to choose? So let's talk about some of the other things. Somebody said emoji. Of course, emoji is totally AAC. That doesn't make me an AAC user, by the way. <clears throat> but I do love using emoji. Um, yeah. So Nicholas was just backing up what I said. One of the first things I tell communication partners is to accept the communication the first time. The only thing that I ever say with regards to this is if I didn't understand it and I try not to play dumb, I'll say, I'll, you know, like, or the pretend that I do understand them when I don't, that's not, that's pretty disrespectful as well. But I, I, you know, if I don't understand them, I'm genuinely saying, I think you're talking about the book, but I don't really understand. Can you tell me in a different way or can you say it in a different way? So um, emojis, let's get on to emojis. I mean, you know, all, um, all AAC users should have access to, it, communicating with emojis is easy. Some of my younger, um, my, I want to say young adults or, uh, you know, older children um, that have gotten their first phones, like literally that's one of the first things I teach them is how to text message with emojis and add emojis on it. It's a very important thing, you know, um, and definitely an accepted form of communication, something that we all use use and can be really, you know, a clear way to communicate. Um, I actually also spent an entire therapy session programming some emoji onto Matthew's uh, iPad. And this is the photo that his mum sent me um, later that night <laughs> that she he kept saying to her, um, what did he get? Too bad, so sad and talk to the hand. And he just put his hand up at her. <laughs> so, um, you know, like using emoji in lots of different ways is really very useful. As are any visuals, any pictures. I don't care how they look or what they come, where they come from. You know, so many kids that just flick through books to find, or people, anybody that flick through books to find context. I mean, the, the power of these different ways of communication is just how um, it's accessible to everybody. Um, and quite often it's about things that are interesting to them, memories that they've had, um, I, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've had lots and lots of opportunities um, flicking through your junk mail or your catalogues or whatever you call them. Um, Diane has just um, made a comment. I have made a student who did not, she didn't, didn't like it when I was wearing my reading glasses. He would grab them off my shirt and try and put them on my face. Um, I did make him tell him on his device and it actually distinguished the behavior as telling me on the device rather than the behavior was too much trouble. Okay. Yeah, there are definitely instances where the behavior is still faster than getting my AAC out. So there are definitely those things um, can, take, um, can take time. Now, 
someone's knocking on my front door, but we'll just ignore that. My husband's out there, this might be the neighbor, but let's just keep going. Um, so yeah, use, use pictures um, in a book, uh, photo albums, magazines, having all those visuals and have them as part of a way to add to your message and share a story is really good. Of course, a lot of our learners are beginning to learn to type or they have learned to type or they've, they can write it's all different forms of literacy and we know how important it is to explicitly teach literacy as well. So typing is another really effective form of communication, of course. Um, and that leads to things like emails, of course, chat windows, messages, text messages, messaging, even handwriting. I mean, all of these are different forms of communication that if you um, are developing some literacy skills or have literacy skills, um, then, you know, obviously these are no brainers in terms of ways to communicate. And one of the things that once I think, well, for me, is that that moving conversations to typing. Do conversations need to be had face to face? What conversations can be moved to typing to level the playing field? And I'm even suggesting things like um, in a Zoom call where you have AAC users and, and speaking people, make everybody use AAC. That levels the playing field so that not one person has um, you know, an advantage or time to take up more of the, the speaking role. So I think it's really important to consider for all of our people what can be moved to, uh, to, to typing or AAC to level that playing field. Okay. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is photos. Like by far and away, the, the, one of the most powerful tools that we have is photos. Um, you know, using your camera roll, uh, you can use tools like Pictello, um, Google Images. And um, I have a, you know, I've been working with lots of families for a long period, long periods of time. Um, one of the young men that I work with, he has quite unclear speech. So, you know, he really tries his hard to talk but not everybody can understand him. And he is a teenager now. And his, his um, parents bought him a mobile phone. Now, I also want to preface this with saying that I have failed as his speech therapist to get AAC to work for him. So we've tried using AAC to back up speech that's difficult to understand. And we've tried implementing that at home school and we didn't have a lot of success. And that, that's fine. It doesn't really have to work for everybody. But I'm going to put my hand up and say, you know, like sometimes it fails. No worries at all. Um, so his parents, when he would turn 13 as a teenager, he got his first phone. And so I taught him to take photos of things that he wants to talk about. So now his AAC is his camera roll. He like legit takes photos of anything and everything. And when you have a when you have a conversation with him now, so he'll be sitting there and he'll be going blah 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 blah, and I'll be catching the odd word and I'm I'll look confused on my face, like I'm not sure what you're saying. And he goes, "Ah, oh, wait a minute!" Pulls out his phone, flip flip flip, shows me a photo. As soon as I see a photo of the context of what we're talking about boom, I know what we're talking about. I can start making sense of what he's telling me. And even if I can't, he's usually got a secondary photo of some really small detail because he's very detailed young man, great language. He's got great ideas of what he wants to share, just as his speech is so unclear. So, um, <laughs> yes, Sarah's just reiterating that um, failing to implement AAC is a real thing. It doesn't always work. Uh, we always share our success stories. Maybe I should do a presentation on all the ways it's failed. Um, look, you know, everything is, uh, <laughs> that's, that's fairly normal for all of us, I'd say. Um, I really like using something like Pictello because what Pictello does is, is you have a photo or a video and you have the beginning of some text that you write with it. So guess what that is? Pictello for a young learner, that's your precursor to Instagram and Facebook because that's what we do when we get on Instagram and Facebook. And if we think about Instagram and Facebook, social media things being really valuable forms of communication, then even our younger learners can learn by using an app like Pictello that allows them to put a picture and start generating some text to move on to that. Yeah. So 
Pictello's great. I mean, it, obviously there are other options that allows you to do photos with text. Um, Pictello is a, is a great useful one. I'm glad that there, we've got other Pictello fans over here as well. Um, Google Images, the thing I wanted to say about this, just checking on my time, I've got to finish up. Um, yeah, so even Google Images, I have a young man, his favourite thing is to type in Google Images and show me the photos of his favourite things. Um, I have this photo wall up on my wall. It's just right behind me here, actually, that wall. Um, the number of valuable conversations I've had um, in front of that, the, of all the kids looking at themselves in their photos. It, it's just amazing. And then once I had one, here's my 17-year-old daughter. She had to have one too. So she had to go off to Kmart and buy herself a, a, the photo board and print some photos. And now anytime anybody comes over, goes into a room, I see her standing in front of it and talking about things. Photos are conversation starters and they're forms of communication every single day of the week. Um, and that leads into that conversation about social media. And um, thank you, everybody, for, yeah, the Pictello, Pictello love coming in over here on the Slack channel. So for social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, blogging even, um, all these forms of social media can be really, really useful for AAC learners. And I don't think that there's um, an age limit. Well, obviously, there are age limits to when you can start using um, Instagram and things like that. But, you know, you can start prepping for it, as, as me um, mentioned before. The good thing about social media Media is that there's no time limitations like quite often there's an expectation if someone sends you an email you reply within a certain time frame or a message you reply in a time frame or if somebody asks you a question face to face you've got to reply and social media that's the best bit you can just go back and reply whenever you want it's easy to share things with more people there are so many easy ways to respond in social media you can respond with an emoji a funny gif um, just by your likes love don't like, wow, all those sorts of things. Um, and the challenges in social media are for people that are non-speaking are the same as um, for all of us, you know, like the challenges, the negative connotations behind social media. So, of course, we have to be aware of those things. Okay, so we are going to finish up. Oh, just to show you, here's my young friend, Matthew. Um, I encouraged him at the end of last year to, to open his own Instagram account. His family were traveling to uh, Europe and they, um, so I made him create an Instagram account so that I could see. So here's a photo of him in Spain with a cow. And, and like he, this is him, he's an emergent literacy, uh, has emergent literacy, is starting to write. So, I mean, all he's written is cow rain. Um, but to me, that's fantastic communication. And, um, and, you know, something where he was having so much engagement with people and people knew what he was doing on his holidays. He had so much to talk about. Um, and his whole Instagram, now he uses Instagram. There's his puppy dog, beautiful, beautiful Larry. Um, and even more to that, you know, even Google, YouTube videos, websites, these are all ways of connecting and communicating with people. Google something, show a YouTube clip, or go to a website. Um Here's a photo. This is Matthew as well, actually. He's really into football. And he was trying, I didn't watch the game the other day, which is a big mistake. I should always watch the game so I could talk to him about it. But um, he was trying to tell me about a particular player that did something. He got sin binned very bad. But, um, you know, we went to the, to the website and he was pointing. I, I couldn't understand the names of the footballers, but he, we just used the website. There you go. AAC, use a website. Easy peasy. Okay, so all these different forms of communication that we've been talking about today, uh, you know, from, from the, our communication devices through the non-verbals to social media, they all have a place uh, for our AAC learners. And I think our role is really to encourage them, um, to respect when they use them, and also look for any opportunities we can to build them. So I think that's it. So I'm sure I think Philomine has been sharing the, the there's a, an article on Learn AAC to do with this, um, uh, this topic that I've talked if you want to, to read more. And um, I also just wanted to take this opportunity to just say that we have got some AAC training series coming out. So we'd love you to, to join in with that too. Um, here is my email address, Amanda Hartman at assistaware.com. If you've got any questions or comments afterwards, after today, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. And that's it. So are there any other questions out there? Oh, Melissa's back there too. Should I yes. stop sharing my screen? You're great. We'll just give people a couple of minutes in case they have any questions sure. in the Slack chat that they'd like to post. 
Um, but great information, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing some really good resources and some good applications of, of things that we all use every day that could maybe be um, looked at in a different way to be able to encourage communication. I think that's a great, a really great thing. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, if anybody's got questions or people saying thank you, thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs> is, it, is it dinner time for you guys in the States? Uh, almost uh, for <laughs> me. We're, we're in, in the middle of the United States and it's just coming up on five o'clock here, but I think okay. it's seven o'clock Eastern time where uh, most of our viewers are. So they're probably hungry, but this <laughs> was a great session to, to snack to. So thank you for that, Amanda. I'll let you, if there are questions, please post them in the Slack channel. Maybe Amanda can address those if they continue to come up. Um, but thank Any you for being with us, Amanda, and especially for taking time from from another country you know we appreciate you sharing your insights and it just goes to show you that communication is is a worldwide consideration something that we need to think about no matter where we are and that we can all work together to make that better so yeah well you know it's it's early in the morning here in australia so and but but you but you're right i think you're you're right like the challenges and the and the experiences that we're having in Australia is the same for everybody. So, so thank you. Thank you everybody for joining. I'm just, there's lots of kind of comments. Some people are up at 2 a.m. Oh my <laughs> word. <laughs> They're dedicated. They, the they meant business. <laughs> so good. thank you so much. We really do. We do yeah. really appreciate it. Keep posting your, your comments in the Slack channel, everyone, but we'll go ahead and close this session. You can join us for the lightning talks, which will be coming up next, which are just some brief pieces that people can share. And thank you again, Amanda, for being with us. We appreciate it. It's been great to be here. Thank you.